You can't have those two at the same time. The actual reality is that it's neither of those. Yeah, that's right. It's neither of those. That's and right. it's Christianity as Christianity took hold. It integrated the things it could integrate. It 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 kind of let fall to the side the things that couldn't be integrated, and it it ended up with a a world that was based on the ancient pagan world in terms of a lot of the forms, but moving using its meaning pointed towards God and towards Christ. You know. Yeah. This is Jonathan Peugeot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Hello, everyone. I am uh, happy to be back with Father Andrew. It's been a while since we've had a discussion, and so we felt like this would be a great time to... uh, to catch up with some of the things that we're doing, Father Andrew has been publishing a uh, a wonderful podcast called The Wolf on the Cross, which documents his visits to Lithuania and exploration of, of Lithuania as this, this amazing center where orthodoxy th- thrived, where Catholicism is there. And that is actually what we're going to talk about. So Father Andrew had the idea of looking at how the church has dealt with the question of its encounter with other religious traditions you know, the, the, the opposition, the, the compromise, the also bringing in all of these types of things. So I'm looking forward to our discussion. Father Andrew, thanks for, thanks for meeting with me again. Thank you very much for uh, agreeing to talk to me. I, I think this is a really interesting topic that does not get a lot of press in our very polarized days. Yeah. And for you also, this whole uh, adventure in Lithuania is also a very personal uh, encounter. Like it's a, it's a personal journey, let's say. It is. Um, I just came back a few weeks ago for my second visit there. And um, just to show how personal it is, one of the things I got to do in the second visit was I visited the small town that my great grandfather was from, where I had been before, but this time I actually got to go inside the Catholic church. That is the one church in that town. Basically, everybody in the town belongs to that church. Mm. The pastor of that church is the pastor of the town, Yeah, which is hard for us who live in the West to imagine that. Um, but uh, he gave us a very long and beautiful tour. And one of the things I got to do while I was there is I actually got to touch the baptismal font that my great grandfather was baptized in 140 years ago. And I got to stand in the place where my great, great grandparents were married um, 160 years ago um, or however many it was, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's extremely personal. And now I've made a number of, of friends that are there that I talk with pretty much every day. And, and um uh, so yeah, it is, it is, um, something very, very close to my heart. So tell us a little bit about what, because I, I imagine that this provokes some insights and also some research into this question, because Lithuania has been such a place of melding and, and, uh, you know, of, of things coming together. So tell me a little bit about what your insights about how the church deals with. with yeah. That. So a lot of people don't know where Lithuania is even on the map. Um, so <laughs> If you're looking at Eastern Europe and then your eye kind of goes up towards the top, that's where it is, up towards the top, right on the Baltic Sea, right across the Baltic Sea from Sweden. It's next to Belarus. It's next to Poland. It's next to Latvia um, and a little piece next to Russia. So if you think about that on the map, that's actually a really important part of what we're talking about. When Christianity splits, um, you know, in the 11th century, give or take, uh, eventually you know, Eastern Europe becomes Orthodox later on, largely speaking, although there's already some some of that going on by the time the split happens. And if you look at where the border is between Orthodox East and Catholic West, it basically runs right there. That's exactly the place where the border is. Mm-hmm. Um, and Lithuania is interesting in that regard. Now, of course, it's Catholic now, but it was also the very last pagan nation in Europe. Uh, it did not become Christianized until the very end of the 14th century. Whoa. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty recent, relatively speaking. And so uh, the encounter of Christianity with paganism, I mean, most of us who are, who are know anything about church history, we think about the encounter of Christianity with paganism, but we think about it a thousand years before that, right? So it's it's all very nicely in the past. It's all very nicely in the books. Mm. All of that has been worked through. You know, we don't really even see the lines that much, uh, you know, unless someone's looking for them, especially trying to undermine Christianity, let's yeah. say. 
Um, but with Lithuania, it's very much more recent and um, just a few hundred years in the past. And uh, even when Catholicism becomes the national religion, there's pockets of paganism that exist for a while. And, and this is the thing that I really want to talk about today, uh, there's a lot of indications of the way that Christians dealt with paganism and the way that Orthodox Christians dealt with being in what was a Catholic majority country. So when that Christianization began to happen in the late 14th century, Orthodox Christianity was already there. Mm. Catholicism was, of course, already there. So you get these two Christian traditions kind of competing in the same space for the hearts of pagans, mm. uh, but also simply living with them and being married to them and, you know, doing life with them. Mm. Right. Um, so uh, it, it forms a really interesting place to look at this question. But I, you know, before we get into that too deeply, I want to just actually talk a little bit about the backstory of Christianity with regards to dealing with other religions, because if we don't know that, then um, what I'm going to talk about in Lithuania might seem weird. Uh, you know, it might seem surprising, or you know, let's let's sweep that under the rug kind of thing. But actually, it's it's normal. It's pretty normal, in fact, right? So you know, beginning with with the Bible itself, uh, just in the Old Testament, for instance, you get. Uh, the encounter of the people of Israel with with the pagan religions of the ancient Near East, right? Uh, Baal worship, of course, number one. Um, also, there's the worship of a god named Shemesh, who is a Canaanite sun god. Um, and uh, so here's the funny thing. Like, we all know about the sort of polemic against pagan religion in, in the Old Testament. You know, there's there's all kinds of mocking of pagan gods and and all this stuff that we we love. You know, it's a lot of fun to read. Uh, we love the showdown on Mount Carmel between uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, you know, uh, you know, with the fire from heaven and so forth. But also what a lot of people don't know is that some of the Baal imagery, like the fact that he's the rider on clouds, that gets used for the son of man in Daniel yeah. and in the Gospels when Christ ascends into heaven. Right. That's really important. It's important to notice that that it's happening in the Old Testament, especially because people don't understand, for example, why we call the Theotokos the Queen of Heaven, because they see that as a title for ancient pagan goddesses. And it's like, yes, that's it. We took it like I not just took it, <laughs> but like we showed you what the real Queen of Heaven is. Right. Right. I mean, OK, so Shemesh is another good one. Right. So one of the um, hypostases of Shemesh that was worshipped actually in Jerusalem, in pagan Jerusalem, mm -hmm. you know, was uh, called Shemesh Tzedakah. Um, and so Tzedakah or Tzedek, it means justice or righteousness. And so it's the sun. Shemesh means sun, like the sun in the sky. Yeah, the son, of son of righteousness yeah. or son of justice. Well, this gets used in Malachi to refer to the son of righteousness who rises with healing in his wings. And then in the Orthodox Church, we use that same phrase, son of righteousness, in our Nativity of Politikian to talk about Christ, who gets worshipped by star worshippers, who now go on to worship the real son of righteousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, that's so you, a, the, 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 the Troparion, the Christmas Troparion is a great example of that, exactly, yeah. where we show how those that worship the stars are now worshipping the maker of the stars, basically. Right. Yeah. And and we're doing it by taking their pagan language mm. and applying it to Jesus, you know. So it's it, again, it's in Malachi. So it's in the Old Testament. So it's nothing new for Christians. It's in the Old Testament, right? Uh, but the New Testament, of course, does this stuff too. And the, there's a, a lot of examples we could point to, but but particularly, I like to look at Saint Paul in the Areopagus, where right before that chapter before that, it says he's really mad because he sees that Athens is full of idolatry. Right. So initially you get the sense of, oh, OK, so when he goes up the Areopagus, he's going to let him have it. He's going to be polemical Paul. Mm. Right. But of course, that's not what happens when he's on the Areopagus. Instead, he takes this altar to the unknown God and says, I'm here to proclaim this unknown God to you. I mean, that altar was a pagan altar that pagan sacrifices were offered on. Mm. I want to invite you all to the very first Symbolic World Summit. Over three days, we will finally meet in real time, in real space, and everyone from this little corner of the internet will be there to explore the theme of reclaiming the cosmic image. Of course, I will be speaking. There will also be Martin Shaw, who is an amazing mythographer, Father Stephen DeYoung of Lord of Spirit fame, 
There will be Richard Rowland from the Universal History Series, Vesper Stamper, Nicholas Kotar, and Neil DeGray that you've all seen on my channel here and there. For entertainment, we have everyone's favorite apocalyptic band, the one and only Dirt Poor Robbins. This event will be the chance of a lifetime to capture and embrace our current moment. So join us from February 29th to March 2nd, 2024 in Tarpon Springs, Florida. Visit thesymbolicworld.com slash summit for more information. I will see you there. That altar was a pagan altar that pagan sacrifices were offered on. Mm. Right. It was not some crypto Jewish altar or something like that. Exactly. This, this is a pagan altar. But, you know, even more interestingly, probably a little less obvious, uh, he quotes from two pagan poets. Uh, so he quotes from Epimenides of Crete, who that line in him we live and move and have our being. Mm -hmm. Uh, he also quotes from Aratus, um, who talks, who says, you know, and we also are, are his offspring. Mm -hmm. Well, both of these lines are about Zeus. Mm. Like this is Zeus poetry. And Paul is saying, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take that. Mm. You know, I'll, I'll apply that to the one true God. Right. So he's, he's subsuming it into what he's doing. He doesn't look at it as being sort of hopelessly polluted. Yeah. Um, I, I, this is so important. I mean, <clears throat> especially when you look at, I mean, the main objection, obviously, to orthodoxy and to, to Catholicism from Protestants are often these types of things where they look at, at, at the, the, the styles of worship or aspects of worship that they can see in the pagan world. They see it coming into Christianity. And then they wonder, you know, does it mean that, well, they don't have to wonder. They declare then that the worship is pagan, but this is something like, even in terms of the revelation of the tabernacle from God himself, you know the structure of the tabernacle is this the structure of every single pagan temple in the, oh yeah in the world a three tiered structure oh, yeah. you know with like the most holy place where you would have that usually they would have the idol there that would be hidden and they would be revealed on certain on certain uh in certain feasts or whatever but the structure itself is is a universal structure and so and so it's a, the way to see it it's like you could see it in in a bunch of ways which is that on the one hand the pagan uh traditions are actually twisting the true faith and now God is twisting it back towards what towards its rightful <clears throat> its rightful uh, direction. Or you could see it that God is able to cover over our sins, right? He's like, okay, this is what you do. I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna turn it in its right direction. But either way, whether it's one or the other, you know, that seems to be what God is doing all the time, which is saving that which is lost. Yeah, I mean, it says in the Psalms, right, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But but sometimes people when, who have this idea of kind of religious cooties, um, they would say the earth is Lord's and the fullness thereof, except for these parts, which are sort of hopelessly not his anymore. You know, don't don't touch that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this kind of thing continues. Right. So I gave just a couple of examples from the Old and New Testament. I could we could talk for hours about just the Bible. Mm. Um, but but Christians continue doing this. So, um, of course, as an iconographer, you know, full well that the tradition of Byzantine iconography owes a lot to the tradition of Egyptian funereal art. Yeah. Right. Like if you look at the, the art that was on, that was related to Egyptian funerals. I mean, again, these are pagans. These are demon worshipers. Yeah. Uh, but even, would... even the Ro it Roman, it's Roman. It's exactly, it's, it has that Egyptian aspect to it. And then it also has a, a very strong Roman element. For oh, example, yeah. the, the, the way that Christ, his blessing hand, like would we say that Christ is blessing like this? That's a Roman sign of address. It's a you can see the Roman emperors doing it in the first century on oh, statues. Yeah. And so, you know, this is but it's funny because it would the funniest thing about this, honestly, Father Andrew, is that the, the same person that can look at ancient pagan practices and see how Christianity transformed them towards the worship of God will like without non-apologetically have a rock band on stage in church and like and <laughs> I realize that it's like you know using the language of the culture to and transforming it, it and it's not even transformed usually in terms of the the rock band on the stage but it's like the Christians actually did a very deliberate theological 
at it, bringing in of these elements and transforming them, like the way that Roman art, for example, moves from paganism to Christianity, you can see it happening. You can look at, you know, the sensual elements being toned down, you know, the different, the, these different elements are being toned down. These are played up. You know, the, the use of the halo was used to, for the emperor, for example. Oh, and yeah. So now we, 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 it, it's a pagan sign that was there before. And so then we're like, no, we're going to reserve this only for the saints, only for Christ and his mother. And so you can see the transformation happening, but it's a, it's not just accidental. Like, it's not just like, it's not just like taking a rock band and putting it on stage in your church. It's a theological transformation yeah. of the pagan things into yeah. the Christian world. There's a creative engagement, right? It's not just sort of adoption. Um, exactly. There's an adaptation also happening. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some things that you could point to as being almost adoption, at least initially, and then the adaptation happens later. One really obvious example are uh, Christian calendars. So the Julian calendar, I mean, it's not named for St. Julius. Uh, you know, it's named for the divinized emperor. Uh, exactly. Emperor. The divinized emperor. It's literally named for what pagans would have regarded as a pagan god. Julius yeah. Caesar is a is a god, you yeah. know, from a Roman pagan point of view. Um, and it's not just the Julian calendar. I mean, the Coptic calendar is based on Egyptian paganism. Um you know, now we think of these as being calendars that belong to churches, yeah. but they didn't start their lives that way. Um, and the churches did not say, let's start with something brand new. And what's funny is they they didn't really take the Jewish calendar very much. I mean, there is there are elements in the church calendar that are from the Jewish calendar. Mm. But the basic idea of a solar year, for instance, of 365 or so days, um, these are these are pagan things. Um one of the probably more obvious ways that Christians uh, dealt with paganism early on, and um, you see it in a lot of saints' lives, is that pagan temples get turned into Christian churches. Um, so the altars that were, you know, had had pagan sacrifices put on them become altars to God. Or sometimes what they'll do is they'll take the building, smash the altar, yeah. <laughs> replace that, um, and but the structure is is you know a, a pagan temple like. Um, lots of examples of that. The Parthenon in Athens, of course, was actually a Christian church longer than it was a pagan temple, mm. uh, but it was a pagan temple. You know, yeah. now it's a museum, but, um, uh, you know, there's a number of, of yeah. well, the Pantheon of, in Rome is one of the most, also the, the most shining biggest example that's still a church now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a gazillion examples of this, of pagan temples that become Christian churches. Mm. Uh, and even the Basilica architecture itself, was from pagan civil architecture. Yeah. You know, um, so it wasn't even for worship. It was, you know, although there's no such thing as secularism in the ancient That's world. Right. Uh, so civil architecture is sacred architecture in the ancient world. Um, another one of my favorite examples, of course, is the classic uh, treatise by St. Basil the Great called The Address to Young Men on the Uses of Greek Literature. Mm. Um, and essentially it's his take on how you read Homer and Hesiod and so forth. And he doesn't say like, that's pagan, don't read it. Uh, but instead he actually says, this is the weird part. He says, you need to master this before you can read the Bible. Mm. Which, I mean, I don't preach that and I would never counsel anybody with that here in 2023. But I mean, it's a pretty yeah, well, we, provocative well, we do, thing we, to say. We do something like that, Father Andrew, which is that, you know, it's like, I actually made the mistake with my kids at the outset to just like straight up read the Bible stories to them, which 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 was probably not the wisest thing to do. And and I realized that actually fairy tales are a good ramp into Bible stories. And so we usually do something like that with our kids is that our kids know the fairy tales more than they'll know the Bible stories at the outset. And as they get older, you know, like eight, nine, 10 years old, then it's easier for them to kind of to 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 take in, especially those Old Testament stories that are that are rough at the outset. Um, and so we see, I think we do something similar with fairy tales that St. Basil talks about in terms of the ancient. Uh, yeah. Myth. Yeah. Um, another example of this, and this is one that's a little controversial, but I, I'm going to want to at least mention it. Um, St. Uh, St. John of Damascus, he wrote a text called, uh, the life of Saints Barlam and Joasaph. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people say that this is essentially just an adaptation of the life of Gautama Buddha, Buddha, yeah. the Buddha. Um, I don't know if that's true. I mean, I've never really studied this closely. It may be that he simply took that story and told his story in a way that's reminiscent of it. Uh, 
who knows? I don't know, yeah. but it's, but, but there is a possibility that there's at least some kind of influence and that's not even, you know, that's not the comfortable paganism. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's it's very far, which is so funny. Like it's funny. We think of demon worship by Greeks and Romans and Egyptians as like, we can deal with that, but Buddhism, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What you know? do we do with that stuff? Yeah. It's freaky. Uh, again, controversial. I'm not saying that that's where he got it from. I, I, I don't know, but you can read about it on the internet. Um, uh, some other stuff that's probably a little bit more um, provocative, but much harder to just uh, whisk away. Um, so within Germanic Christianity, so this is later, right? This, you know, Germanic peoples get Christianized later in church history, um, not until largely like the eighth, ninth century. And as you're moving on, because it's moving north, right? Yeah. Um, so a, a fun example I like to point out to people is there is a, an object called the Frank's casket. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I saw it in the British Museum. Uh, yes. Right there. It's amazing. Yes, it's most of it is at the British Museum. There's one panel of it that's in France. Um, although I think they have a copy of that panel at the British Museum, yeah. so you can see the sort of the complete thing. Yeah, the Frank's casket is really interesting. So, um, you know, it's made in 8th century Northumbria. So that's Northern England. And it's generally believed to have been made by monks. Okay. Um, and it was based on the size and shape. It's probably a reliquary. Hmm. We're not certain, but but probably a reliquary. Yeah. You know, uh, and we, it's called a casket, but it's, 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 you know, it's, it's this a little big. box. Yeah. It's yeah. A, it's a, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not like to hold a body, a body. <laughs> but it's the same shape yeah. as what we would put a body in. And that's deliberate because if you're going to put a, put, the relics of a saint in something you would want to put it in something that looks like a coffin you know yeah. at least that's what most of christian history has done yeah. so if you look at the the uh the images on the frank's casket um one of them is the three wise men you know approaching the virgin holding christ and they're offering their gifts and you're thinking okay good this is a good strong christian's image no problem uh, but then you start walking around the, the casket and, you know, uh, figuratively, of course, because, again, it's just a little box. Uh, on, on one side, you've got Romulus and Remus, the founders of the pagan founders of yeah. pagan Rome, you know, uh, being and raised in like, by the wolves. in like northern England, like, right. <laughs> it's like it, it just shows you that universal history thing that we keep helping yeah. getting and, people and, back to. And we should say, how many pagans are there in Northumbria in the eighth century? probably none mm. it's probably all christian yeah exactly yeah so there's are christians making this thing mm. uh there's at least one of the panels that people aren't sure exactly what it is another one is a battle that takes place in jerusalem and then the one if you look at the panel that has um the three wise men and the virgin on it and the lord it's actually there's a, it's a 50 50 panel so on one side you've got that on the other side you have wayland the smith who is this semi-divinized Germanic smith, you know, divine smith figure who makes magical weapons uh, and that often gods get apprenticed to so they can become powerful. Like it's, it's it clearly, and so it's, it's this pagan image right next to yeah. a Christian image on the side. But it's, in, it's, in, it's, it's interesting in the, in the casket because the Christian image is the image of the pagans coming to worship christ that's yes. what the that's what the image is yes it is yes it is you know so it's interesting you know th this northern uh en english thing and so it's got this germanic pagan image but then it also has stuff from roman history uh all together because that's the cultural soup of northern english christianity in the eighth century yeah but it, it's know? it's but it's if you listen to some of the arguments that you've heard when you were younger, like that you heard people say you could you had these two arguments. One was Christianity is just syncretism; it's all just borrowing from pagans, whatever. And then the other one is Christianity destroyed all the ancient cults. So they went in, they broke everything, and they they ruined the whole Christian world. It's like you can't have those two at the same time. The actual reality is that it's neither of those. Yeah, that's right. It's neither of those. That's and right. it's Christianity, as Christianity took hold, it integrated the things it could integrate. It 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 kind of let fall to the side the things that couldn't be integrated, and it it ended up with a a world that was 
based on the ancient pagan world in terms of a lot of the forms, but moving, using its meaning pointed towards God and towards Christ, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Another fun thing from that same period of Anglo-Saxon Christianity, and I just have to mention this um, because I don't know if Richard's going to mention this in your Beowulf class you're doing with him, but this was something I came across as I was doing translate translation work on Beowulf. Um, so there's a phrase that shows up in it, uh, which is in, in Old English, it's Alf Walda, Alf Walda, right? And a lot of editors actually um, edit this to make it Alwalda, to make it a single word, Alwalda. Now, a, that single word means all ruler. So it's mm. like Pentocrator, right? And this is referring to God. It's pretty clearly mm. referring to God. But if you look at the actual man manuscript, it's two separate words, Alf and Walda. So Walda is ruler. Alf means elves. Oh, yeah. So it refers to God as the ruler of elves. Um, <laughs> which, you know, adjust the translation a little bit, you get Lord of Spirits, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, so so that's interesting. So that's clearly a Germanic pagan reference, you know, elves, mm. right? Elves are just kind of spirits in Germanic paganism. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's an 8th century Christian writing this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alfwalda. Um, so, okay. A couple examples from Norse Christianity, cause I'm comfortable with the, with the Germanic stuff. Um, so in the 13th century, there's a, a church built in Norway called the Hilestad Stave Church. The church doesn't exist anymore, but it's doorposts still do. And they're in a museum now, uh, but they were on a couple of different churches. And if you look at the doorposts, they are carved wood. It's beautiful stuff. It's really, really astonishing. Um, and it is the legend of Sigurd and Fafnir, from the Volsunga saga, which again is Germanic paganism. Um, you've got, you know, Sigurd, who is this sort of semi-divine figure. You've got Regan, who is definitely a divine figure. You've got Fafnir, definitely a divine figure. Fafnir, of course, is a dragon. Uh, you know, in the legend, you know, Sigurd goes down and kills Fafnir because Regan wants him to, so they can get the enchanted gold. And uh, then they decide to, uh, they're gonna eat him because when you eat a dragon, it makes you, gives you magical powers. And he actually tastes some of the juices from the heart and it gives him the ability to understand the language of birds, as it always does. As it always does. Um, <laughs> but this was on the front of a church. Yeah. You know, I had someone tell me one time, I said, can you explain this to me? And they said, oh, well, that was probably to lure in pagans. So they they would see this and they would come in and, and then they would, and I'm like, okay, well, number one, let's imagine you're a pagan. Norse pagan, you see this, and then you go in, and it's clear that this building is dedicated to worshiping some other god. Like, is that really going to work on you? And number two, there are no pagans in 13th century Norway. Right, exactly, they're gone for hundreds of years for, for for several centuries. By hundreds now. of years. Yeah. Uh, and 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 another example, of course, from that time and place. Um, well, not that place, but close to that place, Iceland. You get the Prose Edda, which is one of the major sources of Norse um, pagan mythology. Yeah, and this is written by Snorri Sturluson, who is a Christian. Again, he's never met a pagan in his life because his great 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 grandparents all got baptized. Uh, you know, so he, we don't have any uh, sources of Norse paganism that aren't written by Christians. Yeah. And you see, I mean, it, and you can, if you look at the 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 closer, like closer to the Mediterranean, you see the exact same thing happening. You know, you know, the fact that we have Boethius's text, which is a Christian text written with so much pagan subtext and all of these allusions to to these to these allegorical figure, the fact that you'll find in the Middle Ages people still invoking the muses, you know, these are just things that were part of Christianity. Yeah. And and to try, yeah, to try to parse it one way or the other is 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 just the wrong way to go. And to to say that Christianity is basically infiltrated or whatever. No, this was a conscious thing. When you get yeah. to Dante, you can see that when Dante wrote his poem, it didn't shock anyone. It's not like everybody was like, oh, no, look at him. He's like meeting all these. <laughs> it's like he's mixing Christianity and paganism. It was just like, oh, wow, this is a great, you know, nice synthesis right. of what we pretty much think. And we've always thought we've always believed for the last, you know, 800 years or whatever. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's funny, like you mentioned Boethius, right? So his Constellation of Philosophy, the big major text, uh, when Alfred the Great does his translation into Old English of Boethius, he adds in bits about uh, giants uh, from biblical and Enochic texts to sort of expand out that that, that stuff. So I mean, just talk, just think about the layers in that. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I, I, I want to fast forward a little bit. Um, another example of Christian, you know, and relatively recent Christian engagement with paganism uh, in Alaska, very mm. famous Athabascan spirit houses, which you can see they're not too far from uh, Anchorage. Um, if you ever visit Alaska, worth seeing. I mean, this is a, a pagan practice of building sort of little houses over graves yeah. for the spirits to live in for a while. Um, and, you know, the, the saints, the Orthodox saints who engaged with these people in the 18th century, uh, let them keep that, but sort of reinterpreted it, mm. you know, got them away from cremation, you know, but reinterpreted this. I mean, you can go see this. So if you go there and you see these spirit houses, they have three barred crosses on them. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's really something. Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention that probably would, would freak some people out. Uh, the, the, the numeral system that we use, we commonly call them Arabic numerals, right? Which, okay, that doesn't sound too threatening, but actually they are traditionally called Hindu Arabic numerals yeah. because they are Hindu in origin and also then really developed by Muslims. So in that, by using those numbers, we are using a, a system that was designed in many ways for numerology and all kinds of stuff like this, uh, Every, every day, I mean, we're all doing this. And so it's it's a system that's a combination in some ways, at least how it got to us, of Islam and, of course, Hinduism, which is essentially a sort of pagan set of traditions. Um, so that's that's a lot of fun. OK, so um, so, OK, that's Christianity and paganism. There's lots of things more we could say about that. But I wanted to talk about historical now, historical Christian Orthodox Christian engagement with non-Orthodox Christianity, mm. with other Christians. Right. Again, we know full well the polemics. We know full well the anathematizations of heretics. I affirm all of that, right? But it's also with what's going on right now, it's a it's a little tricky. All of it with the synod of synodality or whatever. I know. It's oh, like it's all in the air. God bless them. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I affirm all that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a dissenter. Um, I'm orthodox. Uh, but also in our history, mm. um, alongside that. Um, so there is one, there's a feast of the martyrs of Najran, um, which I can't remember the date of that right now off the top of my head, and I didn't write it down. But the, one of the main figures in that, he's often called Saint Arethas. Now his Arabic name is actually Al-Harit. Um, so where is Najran? Najran is basically Southwestern Arabian Peninsula. Um, and the they were Christians, and there was a, uh, a a sort of a Judaizing king named Du Nuwas who came in and uh, um, wiped out almost all of them. I mean, there were some left after he did what he did, and so they are commemorated as mar martyrs on our on our calendar. Like, mm -hmm. if you're an an Eastern Orthodox Christian of whatever variety, the martyrs of Najran are on your calendar, Saint Arethas, and so forth. So, what kind of Christians were they in Najran? Were they Byzantines? Were they Greeks? Yeah, probably not. No, it was a, it was they were mostly what we would call Oriental Orthodox. Yeah, uh, but there was also a significant presence of the Assyrian Church of the East, mm -hmm. the, the Nestorians. Um, so they're on our calendar. These are actual saints that are on our calendar, and someone someone might say, well, you know, um, uh you know, martyrdom, you know, mar martyrdom kind of cle cleans up some of, I mean, actually we have saints saying that the, the blood of martyrdom does not wash away the stain of heresy. Mm -hmm. And yet these are martyrs that are on our calendar. Yeah. Right. Uh, another related figure from this time and place is he's called St. Caleb or St. Elisban. He is the king of Aksum. So, Anyone who's been watching your show, your channel for a while knows he's where Aksum is. He's a saint in our in our on our calendar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Because because he yeah yeah because he's related as he's sort of a protector of these Najran Christians. Um, again, I mean, he's the king of Ethiopia That's or, right. or Ethiopian oh, kingdom, man. which makes him and this is late enough that makes him what we would refer to as Oriental Orthodox. Yeah. Again, he's a saint on our calendar. I did um, not know that. This is amazing information, Father. Yeah. Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, another example I, I would give, um, you know, 
Saint Isaac of Syria. Yeah. Not a martyr. Not a martyr. As far as we know, he dies in, in peace. Hmm. Um, canonically, he belongs to the Assy what we would rec recognize as the Assyrian Church of the East, the Nestorians. Yeah. Now, I I've never heard that there's anything in his theology or any of his writing that, that is Nestorian. Yeah. But his whole life was spent outside the canonical boundaries of, you know, what we would recognize as the Orthodox Church. Yeah. What would you do without St. Isaac, though? And his writing... can't get through, rid of St. Isaac. Come right, on. Through his writings, he becomes a saint to the Orthodox Church. Mm. Right? I, again, what do you do with that? Yeah. Um, I don't I don't have a theory for this, by the way. Like some sort of method by which you oh, decide this one and not that one. Oh, but I think that's probably the one. best way to understand it, is that it's not a... It's not... There's the rule, and then there's the messiness of the reality, right? It's like there's the... There's the kind of organic recognition of holiness that the church yeah. that the church does. And it's like, how did it happen? I don't know how it happened, but yeah. it's, there it is. It, and it's it like did. it's like, don't argue with Saint Isaac. You know, and I dare you to. It's like he's an he's such an amazing saint. Yeah. And it's been, I mean, it's been long enough. Like there's no there's no going back on this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can't kick him out. <laughs> you know. Certainly. Uh, not. Yeah. Although there are examples where we did. Yeah. So uh, one example, not talked of about a lot, uh, talked about a lot, but there was, and I can't remember which one it was now, but there was a metropolis in Greece that some centuries ago celebrated the feast of Thomas Aquinas. Mm, really? So, I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I think there are recordings available of his hymns, Orthodox hymns for Thomas Aquinas. Um, now, is that still happening? No, it's not. No, it's but you know, he was another another example of someone that through his writings, because there's a whole like orthodox history of engagement with the writings of Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, of course. Through his writings, at least in one place for a while, he became celebrated as a saint. Yeah. It did not and I, last. And I know there are some like, uh, for example, there's a, a pilgrimage site, uh, Our Lady of Walsingham in England that is recognized by the Orthodox and that the Orthodox go to on pilgrimages, but that is, is from after the schism. It's like, yeah, it's, like it's got an Orthodox chapel there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that I, that I think is maintained by an Orthodox nun, you know? Um, so I want to give one final example before we start talking about Lithuania. Um, but I just kind of wanted to set up these patterns that exist, that exist everywhere in church mm. history. There's thousands more we could probably talk about. Um, so, uh, a, a writer named Lorenzo Scupoli is a 16th century Roman Catholic priest. And he wrote a book called spiritual combat. And uh, it's about, I mean, it's, it's about what it says on the label. Yeah. Uh, so, um, this, this, this work became, um, very interesting to a lot of Orthodox Christians. And in the, a, uh, 18th century St. Nicodemus of the Holy mountain, you know, uh, the guy who puts together the rudder um, and the exomologitarion, you know, and the, is, the, is, 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 the, the ortho orthodox, like the most orthodox. Yes. Orthodox. Yes. Yeah. People look at him as like super hardcore, you know, anti everything I don't like. Yeah. Uh, he takes this work and edits it a little and puts it out in Greek. Mm. I mean, this is, again, he's, this is about 16th century Catholic priest. Right. Um, and then it gets further revised and published in Russian by St. Theophan the Recluse. Wow. So St. Theophan, you know, does even more with it, right? So St. Nicodemus just sort of edits a little bit. I'm not sure how extensive the edits were, but St. Theophan's edits were much more extensive. Mm. That I know. Um, and then, you know, there's even a sort of set of volumes that were actually put up by Conciliar Press a long, long time ago with titles like Victory in the Unseen Warfare and, and sort of stuff like this. That was a sort of, um layman's version of of this you know like taking it apart and looking at it and explaining it and so forth right so this is a catholic text that's made its way into the orthodox church and actually been handled and promulgated by saints yeah by saints you know again no one doubts the orthodoxy of saint nicodemus no one doubts the orthodoxy of saint theophan the recluse these are significant saints of the you know relatively modern period Very modern age yeah um, that's amazing i mean but i think in some ways to me at least what it does is it 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 it's i think it it's there to also keep us humble and to be careful you know to understand that god we don't we don't contort we have the canons and we should live by them but that also god is not in the box that we think he is god does not 
you know, it's like we need God and God does not need, you could say, <laughs> does not need us in the same way, let's say, that that no. that, that God is 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 manifesting himself where where he pleases. That's right. That's right. Okay. So let's talk about Lithuania. All right. Uh, Lithuania. With, with, with all that background. Um, yeah. You know, everywhere you go there on uh, pretty much every Catholic church, and I've even seen some of this in some of the Orthodox churches, although most of the Orthodox churches are, there are very Russian. Um, but uh, almost everywhere you go, you see the, the sun cross. Right. And um, so it's, and again, it's what it says on the label, right? It's a cross with a sun sort of imagery integrated into it. And there's yeah. lots of versions of this. And sometimes you'll see a crescent moon at the bottom, mm -hmm. which is interesting. You know, Orthodox Christians seeing a crescent moon at the bottom of a cross, we largely might think of, okay, this is about conquest of Islam. Yeah. But it, it, in, in the Baltic case, it's not, you know, um, the, the, the Balts are not conquering Islam. It, it exists there, but only in, it's always been a minority, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, so it's the sun and moon, um, you know, and, and this cross was a pagan symbol. Mm. It was absolutely a pagan symbol. And now you see it on the top of almost every single church in Lithuania. Um, you know, there are no Lithuanian pagans still around, uh, although there are some neo-pagans, but that's a newer thing. Yeah. Um, so they're the Baltic... LARPing, they're just LARPing anyways. <laughs> God bless them. I think that is true. Um, so... Um, <laughs> So uh, one an, an, a really interesting um, bit of material culture from pagan Lithuania is something, and I know I'm going to mispronounce this, but you probably don't have a lot. Of, actually, you Lithuania. do have some Lithuanian fans. Oh, you do. I met some of them when I went That's to Lithuania. Hilarious. That's hilarious. In fact, when I gave I gave a a year ago when I gave a talk at a church in Vilnius, one of the first questions that someone asked me was, "Do you know Jonathan Pajot?" <laughs> Like well, he's Canadian. He's Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> well, that means I need to go to Lithuania. I've always wanted to go. My oh, goodness. you totally. Should. If you go, I will go with you. All if right. You, if you would amazing. accept me to go as oh, your that, fellow oh, pilgrim, sure. let's do it. I think you would find it a very interesting place to go. Um. So yeah. So there's a figure from Baltic paganism called the uh, Dev Dirbis, and what that word means literally is God maker. Mm. Uh. So a God maker is. A carver of religious images. Oh, there you go. Uh, so that's that's what that is. Uh, and so back in the day, you know, this guy would have been essentially carving idols, mm. right? Um, idols and also then used in actual uh, pagan worship, but then also essentially pagan icons that yeah, are like used for house. devotional purposes. Yeah, for the like house, house and, idols and things like that. Right, right, right. And... Um, so these are these traditionally were placed up on top of wooden poles. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is called, and I'm, I know I'm going to get this wrong too, uh, coplet stulpis, a coplet stulpis, which means chapel pillar now mm -hmm. is sort of the, the idea. So you can see that word uh, coplet is related, part of that, that piece coplet is related to the word chapel. Um, and so it would be a wooden pole. And then on top of it, you would have this, this carved uh, statue. And then there would usually be a, a roof over top of it. Um, and then often the sun cross on top. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so this uh, survives. But now if you find one of these things and they're actually all over Lithuania, mm. like you could just be driving along and just see one by the side of the road, mm. often in the middle of nowhere. You know, um, if you see one now, you're not going to find uh, Dievas or Perkunas, you know, who are these these Baltic gods? You're not going to mm. find them on the couple of um, you're going to see most often there's a figure called uh, Rupin Toyelis. So Rupin Toyelis is, is Christ um, as he's going to his passion. So there's sort of two different poses. You'll see him like yeah, with yeah, his that, face in his yeah, hands yeah. like this, often called the, the pensive Christ, or you sometimes see him standing and bound, mm -hmm. you know, his hands are bound. Yeah. So this is Rupin Toyelis, often called the pensive Christ. That's the it's most a Russian frequent. tradition of that too. Of like it, in some of the remote places of Russia, they have this whole carving tradition with that figure, very important. Where do you think they got it? Yeah, yeah, it's probably the uh, same. The it's same from there. It's from the Baltics, um, and of course, it spreads into. It's throughout the former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. So mm. you've got it in Poland as well. Mm. They've got it in Belarus. They've got it in Ukraine. Mm. Um, yeah, um, 
often then you'll see uh if you don't have Rupin Tuyalis there, you'll see um the, the Virgin Mary. Uh, you'll see lots of saints, especially St. George, uh, is pretty popular. Um, also, of course, the Catholic St. Casimir, uh, who is the, the Catholic patron of of Lithuania. Not an Orthodox saint, but he's he's their big saint. Mm. Uh, he's buried there in their national cathedral. Um, so related to that, you'll also see, again, the same, the, the carver, the wood carver, called a kriz dirbis, which means cross maker. There you go. Uh, and, you know, the the Lithuanian standing crosses are basically an extension of this uh, Dyev Dirbis practice. Mm. That's the name of the person, but I don't remember what the name of the practice itself is. Yeah. But it's an extension of that, but it's but obviously focusing on the cross itself, right? And they can be incredibly ornate. Yeah, you know, I just ornate. made one, by the way. Oh, really? Yes, yeah, uh, three meter, like nine foot a cross with a single a mass that, that goes into the ground and and it's three you know, goes into three and there's mother of god and saint john oh, yeah. the sun and the moon at the top and a little roof at the at the top yeah yeah it's a massive project yeah yeah uh and and so sometimes there will be little statues embedded right at the the point where the cross pieces meet mm. usually christ again often usually the rupan to uh but it can be other figures sometimes too and again you'll see these by the side of the road uh, they will be placed there sometimes in commemoration of an event mm -hmm. or of, of per people. Um, a lot of pious people just put them in their yard. Mm. Like, so you'll, there'll be this 10, 15 foot tall cross in the front yard, you know? Um, and a lot of churches have them in the churchyard yeah, as wow. well. Um, so, and then of course the, the classic, you know, place where people might've seen these is the Hill of Crosses yeah. where there's, uh, hundreds of thousands of them. And um, there's actually a legal limit on the size of a cross you're allowed to place there, which is nine meters. <laughs> so, that's amazing. So that's if you're like, going mean, to, if when we go to Lithuania, you decide you want to put a cross there, just, just be aware that that's, sure that's less the limit. Nine meters. I love it. It's hilarious because it's like in North America, you would expect it to be like five feet or something, yeah. something like some ridiculous small thing. It's like, well, there no. is a legal limit, but no. it, you know, nine meters, don't go beyond that. These things <laughs> tower over you. I mean, it envelops you. It envelops you. Yeah. And, you know, this is in many ways, this is a spiritual heart of this country. And mm. it's not just Roman Catholics that go there, although obviously mostly Catholics. You can go there and you can see Orthodox crosses there. Mm. Um, and And Protestants go there as well. You know, and um, often you see people writing on many of them. It's usually lists of names of people that they want to pray for. And most of the writing, of course, is in Lithuanian. But you can see many languages, many, many languages from all over the world. Mm. People that have made their pilgrimage, brought their cross there. Um, so, I mean, it's largely regarded as a kind of a Catholic place of pilgrimage, but Orthodox Christians go there. I've been there twice now myself. I placed a cross there both times mm. and brought, you know, two of my children with me. They placed a cross there with the names that they wanted to pray for on there, you know? What is the, th this hill, what is the story about the hill? Like, why, why do people go there? What's the, what's the legend or the story related? Yeah. To so there's a lot of, there's a lot of different origin stories uh, for the Hill of Crosses, but the one that I think is the truest one um, is, uh, so the Hill of Crosses seems to have arisen during the Russian Imperial period. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's the earliest references to it. So you're talking like early 19th century, possibly. Um, and um, the, the, there's a tradition that uh, there was a man who had a, a, a daughter who was very, very ill. And so he was at her bedside every night praying to God to please heal her. And then finally, um, after a long time of this, uh, the Virgin Mary appears to him and says, um, take up your cross and bring it to the place that I'll show you. And so this man becomes a Chris Dirbis and he fashions this wooden cross and he starts carrying it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, a, it's a long distance. And then finally she appears to him again and says, this is the place. And so now Lithuania has no mountains. So actually the word, um, uh, 
gunless for for mountain is just means a hill yeah uh you know so th they'll use the same word like they would re use gunless to refer to the mountains that we have here in north america but but they know full well that there's no comparison between them you know um so it's a hill and it's kind of a long hill so it's spread out you know o over a, a ways and has a couple of peaks to it um and so he places the cross in this hill and then he begins the walk back home and then when he is reaching his where his home is, uh, two people come running out of the house to uh, to greet him. One is his wife, and one is his healed daughter, mm. who now can not only stand but run. You know, and so so then it the tradition then grows that you if you're going to go there you bring a cross, and it can be I mean people bring crosses that are like this, mm -hmm. uh, everything from this to you know nine meters. Uh, <laughs> Smaller ones, people will hang from bigger ones. So you can find crosses that have like hundreds of crosses hanging from them, mm. uh, leaning up against them. I mean, it's just it's just a mess of crosses, but a beautiful mess. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it gets, especially during the Soviet period, the Soviets, of course, hated this place. So they would bulldoze it down or light it on fire um, and they would wipe it all out. And then overnight, it starts growing back mm. because people just come and they place their cross and they pray their prayers um you know some pl place the cross there because they're praying for um someone who's ill or praying for someone who has died um some place it because of a happy occasion like the first time i went for instance there's a woman who's bringing along her her boy and says come on let me show you the place where i put the cross when you were baptized mm. you know so so that kind of thing um, again, it's a place of sort of universal Christian pilgrimage. They don't check your religious ID card at the door, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, another one that's probably a little bit controversial from Lithuanian history, and, and people might not realize it's Lithuanian history, uh, is the Orthodox Saint Peter Mohila. So Saint Peter Mohila is the Metropolitan of Kiev. Um, and during uh, after the the you know the loss of the churches to the to the Uniates, um, so Kiev, of course, in Ukraine, but the Grand Duchy of Lithuania includes most of Belarus and Ukraine mm -hmm. at that point in history, and at that point is actually then part of the the uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, right? So Saint P Peter Mohila, a lot of people point at him and say he's a Latinizer, you know, he's just he's using Latin textbooks, he's a Latinizer, he. he whatever, but he's a saint. He's an actual Orthodox saint. So that means you have to deal with what he did. We mm. can critique it, but um, there's actually been, you know, so some scholars, of course, like um, Father George Florovsky really critiques him and says, this is a Latinization and so on and so forth. But there's other scholarship that you can read now that essentially says, well, St. Peter was actually trying to do with Catholic theology that was around him and that he had to deal with because he's living in it. Mm -hmm. He was trying to do with that like the early church fathers were doing with pagan philosophy. Mm. So I'm I'm not an expert to tell you what the truth of the matter is, but I mean, this is another way of interpreting him and it's worth kind of exploration. So that's actually a theological engagement. It's not just sort of material culture stuff. It's actually like language and, and so forth, you yeah. know? Um, so that's a really, he's a really interesting figure. Um I want to finish up by talking about a couple of icons, but before I do that, there's a significant practice that I want to mention. So in Lithuania, there is a two day holiday called Valinus. Uh, so Valinus um, from the word, uh, I think it's Veles, which means soul. So Valinus is November 1st and 2nd. The all um, souls basically. Exactly. It's the, the feast of all saints and all souls. And uh, in, in the Catholic tradition, and the practice in Lithuania on those days is to visit the graves of your departed loved ones. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Lithuanian cemeteries, they're not like most cemeteries in North America, where it's just row upon row of stones and they've hired somebody to mow the lawn. And there might be flowers that people put that die, you know, whatever. Um, you know, there's sometimes there's more to that, more than that. But I mean, most cemeteries in the U.S. Yeah. I don't know a lot about Canada, but most no, of the it's US the are same. Like that. They're pretty bare. Yeah. In Lithuania, every single grave plot 
is outlined in either cement or stones. So they're like little or or sometimes uh, a fence. Yeah. Um, and they're all like flower gardens yeah. and they're immaculately taken care of. And it's not because there's some gardener. Can you imagine how much work that would be? Yeah. You know, they're that way because the family takes care of them. Um, I went to the cemetery where my ancestors are buried and I went to the grave and I, we found the grave actually of my family, which was an astonishing moment, you know, um, and it's it was immaculately taken care of. Everything was in perfect order, mm. perfect order, right? So so Lithuanians visit the graves of their relatives twice a year, once on the day that is the an, the anniversary of the death, mm -hmm. and then also at Vel Velenus, right? And particularly at Velenus, they will bring candles and place them there. And so if you go to cemeteries in Lithuania at night during Velenus, it's almost like another city. Mm with all the candles. I mean, it's just, you can see an outline of the cemetery in candles. Mm. And it's just completely filled in with these little flickering flames. Um, so Orthodox Christians do this in Lithuania on those days, mm. even though those that's not the Orthodox feast of all souls or of the departed, but they do it. They visit the graves of their relatives. They put the candles. There are specific prayers to be prayed uh, when you go there. Now, it's interesting, there's a th sort of orthodox adaptation that's occurred. So the Saturday before the Feast of St. Demetrius at Thessaloniki is traditionally a Saturday of souls, right? We think of usually the ones in Lent but or around Lent, but, but that's also a Saturday of souls traditionally in the Orthodox Church, the Saturday before October 26th, right? So, of course, most, most Orthodox Christians in Lithuania are on the old calendar, so that would mean that it's about November 8th or whatever is when that, uh, or actually it's a Saturday before November 8th, which sometimes would kind of coincide with villainous. Right, right, right. You know, because the, of course, Catholics are on the new calendar. Um, so what they do is they visit the cemeteries on villainous. And then on that Saturday, that's usually at, right after they go to church and they pray for the departed in mm. church. Yeah. So they created this hybrid practice, you know, again, they're just, they're, they're taking something from Catholic practice and they're engaging in it themselves. Um, and there are, you, you talk to, to Lithuanian Christians and, and a lot of them will say, now, I don't know if the truth of this, a lot of them will say, oh, Velenus actually is, is pre-Christian. Yeah. Um, which is believable, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. totally believable. Um, so yeah. So they make this kind of annual pilgrimage um, to the graves of their family and again, it's not because it's a feast day on the Orthodox yeah. calendar. It's it's now those those are public holidays in Lithuania. Mm. One of the advantages of what is at least still officially a Christian nation, um, they have religious freedom, but you also get November first and second yeah, off yeah, from work and school. That, no. You also get you know August fifteenth off. You get mm. you know uh, 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 June twenty fourth. You know, like in fact, uh, Saint John's Day in June is a it's called yoninus is a huge holiday there huge mm. huge holiday right um and a fun little thing i was talking to one of my lithuanian friends one time because we had started to see uh fireflies in our yard i don't know if you have them where, where you are yeah um and i asked him i said do you have fireflies in lithuania he said oh yeah we have fireflies we call them yon vabalis i was like what does yon vabalis means he says it means saint john's bug so they literally name the fireflies after the forerunner there in Lithuania, mm -hmm. um, probably because of the it, probably because of the summer feast time of year, June twenty fourth. That's yeah. right, yeah. right, exactly, exactly. Okay, so I want to I want to finish up with with Lithuania, but talking about two different icons, um, one that a lot of people probably know about, and I think we talked about uh, when I was with you uh, with Richard when we talked about this documentary, The Wolf and the Cross, before, mm. and that's Our Lady of the Gate of the Dawn. I won't go into a lot of detail because we talked about it before. But it's worth noting that this icon, which is uh, on uh, above a gate in Vilnius, the capital, uh, there's some possibility that it might have an Orthodox origin. Mm -hmm. There's some possibility that it might have spent some time in Orthodox churches, but there's no good evidence for that. Mm -hmm. uh, even if all of that is true for most of its life, it's been in a Catholic chapel. In fact, one of the times I went to see it in my most recent trip, mass was going on right in front of it when mm -hmm. I went there, right? Um, this is the national icon of Lithuania, 
Our Lady of the Gate of the Dawn. And it's it's the Theotokos as she's depicted in Revelation chapter 12. Clothed in the sun, the moon at her feet, a crown of 12 stars. Like that's that's the image, hmm. right? And um, a copy of this icon was very likely given to St. Seraphim of Sadov and is the famous icon in front of which he prayed and in front of which he hmm. died. Yeah. You know, given to him probably in Kiev because veneration of this icon spread throughout you know, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Um, you know, Orthodox Christians make pilgrimage to that icon, venerate that icon. It has a feast day on the Orthodox calendar. This, as far as anyone has ever known, Catholic icon is mm. celebrated on the day after Nativity. And local Orthodox Christians, including the bishop, including clergy, go and pray on 11 in front of this icon on the day after Christmas mm. in this Catholic chapel. Yeah. Right. And it is, you know, it's, it's, this is the, the calendar of the Russian Orthodox church has this icon on it. Mm. Um, lesser known. And this is one of the visits I made in my most recent stop in Lithuania. So there is a monastery near Konas. So Konas is sort of the second city of Lithuania. Um, it's in the center of the country. It was for a time, the capital during the interwar period, because Vilnius was held by the Polish uh, during that period. And so the capital gets moved to Konas and uh, second largest city. So there's a monastery near Konas called Pajaislis Monastery. So Pajaislis was uh, built, if I, as I recall correctly, in the either, either the 16th or 17th century. Um, and it was built as a Catholic monastery, right? So it's built by Catholics for Catholics. And um, you know, this is the uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth period. And um, so Catholicism is the official state religion of the whole Commonwealth. Of course, there's still Orthodox minority, a significant Orthodox minority, especially if you look at the areas that are now Ukraine and Belarus. Mm -hmm. But even still in Lithuania proper, there was some Orthodox. So Pajaisis Monastery, one of the things that's um, made for this monastery is an icon of the Virgin Mary. Um, and so it's called Our Lady of Pajaisis, right? And if you look at it, uh, it's it's painted probably by an Italian. It seems to have been a gift from the Pope. Um, if you look at it, it's a very Western sort of Renaissance depiction. Um, you know, it's not it's not sensual at all, right? It's actually very restrained. You know, um, there's a sort of a a circle of roses in the icon. So I mean, it's not a Byzantine icon oh, at all, yeah, yeah. like a circle of roses. Like if you put that on an icon, yeah. you know, that would get returned probably, you know? Uh, and so it's definitely a very Western depiction painted by an Italian gift from the Pope for this Catholic monastery. Okay. And it's venerated, you know, uh, miracles start to be associated with this icon. So in the late 18th century, the partition of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth is complete with a third partition and Lithuania becomes part of the Russian Empire. Okay, so um, the, the Russian Empire, I'll just say, was not kind to Lithuania, mm -hmm. um, and in many cases engaged in religious persecution, um, which, if you're interested in that, episode four, which has not yet been made, but episode four of The Wolf from the Cross is going to be talking about Lithuania and the Russian Empire. Um, it's not going to be a comfortable story for a lot of mm -hmm. people. It's just the reality. The Russian Empire engaged in, in religious persecution of non-Orthodox. Um, so one of the things that happened was churches and even monasteries that belonged to the Catholic Church were taken and given to the Orthodox, mm. right? And Pajaisis Monastery is one of those places. So in the, um, I think it was in the 19th century, um, it becomes a Catholic, uh, an Orthodox monastery. And um, I should mention, by the way, uh, you know, the architecture and the interior decor of this monastery is absolutely astonishingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's really something uh, very different from a lot of Western churches, definitely different from Eastern churches, but it's really, really worth looking up um, mm. anyway. Um, so, so what do they do with this icon? That's like the altarpiece, you know? So it's a major, very prominent image in this mm. church. What do they do with this icon? They say, Oh, uh, look at this Italian thing. Let's get this out of here. Get some good Russian iconography in here, you know. No, they keep it. Yeah. And they venerate it. And they take the Catholic feast day of the icon and put it on the Russian calendar. Mm. So it becomes a feast of the Orthodox Church of this 
miracle working Catholic icon. Mm. Orthodox Christians make pilgrimage to it. They especially would go on the Dormition. Um, the feast day is July 15th. It remains on the Russian Orthodox calendar. If you go there now, it is once again a Catholic monastery. Um, and uh, so it was given back in, when Lithuania became independent in 1915, I think it was, uh, from the Russian Empire. A lot of churches that have been taken from the Catholics were were given back to them, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so it reverts to being a Catholic monastery. And um, so here's a couple of fun details. Not only do Orthodox Christians continue to make pilgrimage to this Catholic monastery to venerate this wonder-working icon that has a completely Catholic origin, mm. but was sort of Orthodox for a while, the the Orthodox Church maintains the feast the day of feast this icon, still, yeah. even though the Catholics have moved it. So what you're looking at when you see the July 15th feast is the old Catholic feast day maintained by the Orthodox Church, even now. Mm. Right? Um, yeah, so so it, this is still, like, you can look this up. The Russians call it Pozhaiskaya, uh, Pozhaiskaya, which I'm sure I'm probably mispronouncing, but it's probably pretty close. But the name of the monastery is Pozhaislis, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and so again, this is an example of, uh, this sort of chorus border. Yeah. Right. It's, you know, one could look at that and say, ah, oh, syncretism, you know, but what's happening is simply, as we looked at the tradition of the church, yeah, from the Bible, early Christianity and so forth. Um, so Right. So so those are just some examples that I, that I could point out. I mean, there's there's a number of other things that we could mention, like burial practices, for instance. Um, Orthodox burials in Lithuania tend to, rather than having the cross at the foot, which is sort of the Orthodox tradition, they often will put the at the head, which is, you know, They're also which is in the West. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's other things you could mention like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, so... You know, but in our life, I mean, it's like in our life, this is at least for my life, this is true. You know, I to be honest, like, you know, you're not going to take my Christmas songs away from me. I don't know what to tell you. It's like I love Western Christmas songs. I think they're beautiful. I think they're wonderful. I wouldn't want them sung in liturgy, but you're not going to completely take them away from me. Like you will hear yeah. them in my house and we will sing them and we will love them. You know, so there's yeah. some of that all over the place, I think. Yeah. I mean, like just like let's just look at Orthodox Christianity here in the West. Uh, we've taken a whole bunch of stuff from other Christians, largely without um, a lot of analysis yeah, uh, in, in many cases, right? So Sunday school, I mean, Sunday school, I thought exactly Sunday, Sunday school, school is the, probably the most obvious yeah. um, uh, seminaries. I mean, yeah. you know, now seminaries existed in Orthodox history before it ever made it to here, but seminaries are not the ancient Christian tradition. Mm. Like there are other ways of training clergy. Um you know, you mentioned Christmas carols. I mean, that's a really, really good example, Christmas carols. And, you know, it's great. You know, many, many Orthodox in the West will sing the Christmas carols from wherever their tradition is from. Um, but, I mean, you can still get to hear Joy to the World and Silent Night and, you know, this stuff that's that's just the English language Christmas carol repertory, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, an another great example, I think, of this um, is uh, the fact that we have parish membership. Yeah, yeah. That's not a thing, in mo mostly on the other side of the Atlantic uh, in Orthodox Yeah, well, churches. parish councils and all that stuff. Parish councils are right. another big example of that. Um, and, you know, something that's dear, near and dear to both you and me, media. Yeah, yeah. Using, using especially modern media for Orthodox purposes the Catholics and the Protestants were there long, long before us. Mm. Right. Um, so, all right. So, I mean, like what, what do you, what's the takeaway from all of this stuff? Um, yeah. And I'm it doesn't mean that anything goes, I think it's important to be careful. It's like, we're yeah. not at all saying that, all right, so then, you know, whatever, like it all, it's all, it's all, but it, it's really about hierarchy. You know, it's usually just a, an understanding of hierarchy is that we have, we have the, the main traditions, we have the canons, we have all of these things which guide us. And then we have to understand that those are not like a machine. They're not like a computer that runs 
and that no. that tabulates. It's a it's an organic reality that's connected to the world, and and there's room mm. for God to act within that in ways yeah. that surprise us constantly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, like so, like why does the church do this? How does the church do this? Um, the first question I think is easier to answer than the second one, but I, I should say it's not about putting a stamp of approval on non-Orthodox religion. Obviously not. The same Old Testament that uh, you know pokes fun at the gods of the nations also steals their stuff. Mm. <laughs> you know, uh, right? So, so it's not about putting a stamp of approval. It's not right. Yeah. Um, it also doesn't happen without creative engagement. Like there are always changes made to the work to make it conform to Orthodox Christianity. And it can be maybe a little uncomfortable to see that in process. Yeah. It's a mess. It's the not clean. Are... It's not a clean thing. It's a messy no. process. And, sure. and, you know, I've, I've studied this and I intend to study this a lot longer, mm. but I, I haven't found like a theory of it. No. Like, this is how you do that. Well, or correctly, you know, but it's, it's still a thing. It's, it's happening. Right. Um, so like the, the why of it, right. Um, it, it's because whatever is being adopted and adapted, I think it's important to put those two words together in this adopted and adapted. It was seen as being for the salvation of Christians. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not about like, Oh, I want to adulterate my pure or, or, Oh, I'm some kind of, you know, liberal ecumenist, um, that's not what's no, going that's on. That's that's not what's going on. Um, it's it's like oh, here's something that we can use for the salvation of people. Mm. Um, and like I, I I said this in the most recent episode of Wolf and the Cross, um, an icon of the Theotokos is an icon of the Theotokos. Yeah, like it, it is what it is. Like it, it, it might have been made by somebody that I would regard as as a heretic. Uh, it, it might have spent all of its life in the hands of people who are not Orthodox Christians, but it still is what it is. Yeah. And the church is able to recognize that and does recognize that. Mm. Right. Um, you know, you know, it's funny. We have this saying now uh, from the zeitgeist, love is love. Now they don't mean by that what I'm about to say, but love is love, which means that someone who's actually engaging in acts of love, real love, Christian love, is doing it, mm. even if that person is not a member of the right church. That's right. It it is real. All truth is God's truth. I mean, Saint Justin Martyr very famously talks about the the spermaticos logos, right? The mm. the logos and seed form that he sees everywhere. I mean, he's looking at pagan philosophy, and we should remember that pagan philosophers are not just a, not a bunch of ivory tower academics who never sully themselves with religion. These are actual demon worshippers. <laughs> Yeah, well, also, I mean, it's it, it's like read read Plato, folks. It's there's stuff in Plato that you would blush at, and so yeah. you know, the, so the idea that we can read it as Christians and we can take the good and let leave the bad fall to the wayside is something the Christians did from the very beginning, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, that we I mean, continue to do through our whole history. Yeah, I mean, this is you know, like this is what Saint Basil says in that text that I mentioned earlier. He says, "Be like the bee, right? This is the original be the bee. Mm. Uh, you know, go to the pagan flower." Hour, take what you need and leave the rest mm. that's that's what he says yeah um you know he doesn't say you know don't go near that <laughs> right and and he's living in a time when paganism is on the wane he doesn't have to do that mm. he, he's not he's not feeling pressure from the society yeah exactly you yeah, know he's on the winning side at that point yeah he's, uh, he's yeah late side. fourth century i mean he's yeah they're 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 winning you know um so I, I think that, you know, if, as, if we look at this question of creative engagement, um, I believe that it, particularly at this time of polarization, that we have so much of that, where it's really about lining up all the guns and blasting the other side, which, I mean, polemic is sometimes appropriate. The church fathers do it, especially when someone is attacking or trying to undermine the church. Mm. They, I've never seen them do it simply because someone who has a wrong belief or wrong practice just exists you know it's really about it's it's a defensive thing to do mm. now they're, now they're not being defensive in the sense that we talk about it now yeah. but they're being defenders but they're actually defending yeah. against actual attacks they're not um 
they're not looking for enemies. They're not looking for people to debate. They're they're actually defending against real attacks, right? Um, and and here's the thing: I believe that if we can if we can begin to understand this creative engagement better, um, not only can we do it ourselves, and God willing, do it well, probably with some stumbles along the way, like we're going to make some mistakes, uh, but we can make them in good faith. But I think that this, in many ways, is a way forward out of the, our polarizing. It's a demonic spirit, actually, mm -hmm. the spirit of polarization. It's a way forward out of that because it's actually about humility, and demons can't do humility. Um, and and it's not. I would also say it's not just something like, oh, this is a good idea for now here in 2023. I think it's pretty clear this is what the church has always done, mm -hmm. yeah. because. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Or as St. Paul said, you know, whatever things are good, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are beautiful, think on these things. He didn't say whatever things are in this box that I'm presenting you with. It's whatever things. And he himself did this. He took some of these whatever things and, and made use of them. Mm. You know, so the same guy who said, don't worship Zeus also took Zeus poetry and applied, it, applied to it to God. That's right. So, so thanks Father Andrew. This is amazing. I mean, you know, I'm going to re-listen re to this just for all the examples. There's so such wonderful examples that, that can you know, help us see just to what extent this has been happening. And, and you're really also bolstering the, you know, what Richard and I's universal history position is, which is that, like you said, this is something that Christians have always done that the, even the old Testament is already happening. Um, and so we just need to, yeah, humility, move forward with humility and also attention, you know, and prayer. So yeah. thanks, Father Andrew. This has been wonderful. And also and good luck. I Good luck with the continuation of the, the Wolf and the Cross. Can't wait to see all that. Thank you. It's a big, it's a big project, bigger than I think we realized, but mm. we decided we wanted it to be big. Uh, so we're just going for it. I mean, it's going to be nine episodes of two to three hours each. So uh, we just released episode three. So as I like to say at the end of each episode, we've got a lot more stories to tell. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Father Andrew. Thank you. Mm -hmm.